This is one part of lecture two, and the uh, the other part deals with patterns. This part deals with the precautionary principle. The learning objectives for this uh, part of the lecture are uh, dealing with precautionary principle, that it's a decision criteria that helps prevent possible damage when you don't have enough information. We're going to define that in a second. That we're really trying to develop an idea of how to increase and restore ecosystem health. And we're going to do this by a definition that relates to how ecosystems can withstand stress and even respond to stresses by increased health. And um, this relates to the uh, idea of resilience. So those three things are related. Precautionary principle to try to improve and uh, uh, protect ecosystem health, what we mean by ecosystem health, and the idea of resilience. So first of all, the precautionary principle is is stated a lot of different ways, and you'll see this stated a lot of different ways, but it really boils down to when the outcome is uncertain, choose actions that will lead to the least damage. And so a real big piece of this is uncertainty, and you can see by the little bars at the bottom what we mean by this. It's very simple. If something is known to be safe, there's a range where it's known to be safe. There's also maybe a range of some environmental stress, like a toxin or like uh, too much heat or something like that, that's proven to cause harm. And then there's a region in there where it might cause harm or it might not. You really don't know. And this is where you need to pay, take precaution. So don't look at this as you might like a traffic light where green means go, red means stop, and yellow means speed up. It's really the other way around. It's green means green means go ahead, red means stop, but yellow means really start applying the brakes early and do something that's going to avoid damage. Okay, so this idea of finding this middle area that we need to uh, be cautious about is uh, related to the types of errors that we're willing to make when we make scientific statements. So if we err on the side of definitive proof, that was we really want to say something that we can that we can prove and we can provide all sorts of evidence for. We don't make we don't want to make a statement unless we're really certain about it. This type of proof avoids the false positives. It avoids saying something that we can't really prove. And one way people talk about this, although that's a little awkward, is to minimize the type one error. Another is to err on the side of precaution. That is, you're going to make statements. Uh, when there might be a problem and you can't really prove it yet to the same standard of say 95% confidence or, or the same sort of statistical proof, but you're willing to accept some false positives in order to catch the problem early and maybe avoid uh, avoid further problems. So like the, like the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is the idea of precaution is that you look for preventative methods early and maybe just by applying a little bit of preventative me me uh, um, measures you can avoid a lot of damage. And also sort of in the language of statistics they talk about, talk about this as minimizing the type 2 error. So here's an example that's in the news now and, and, and relevant is the regulation of gen genetically modified organisms. The U.S. has regulations that are based on what they call substantial equivalency. So if somebody wants to grow a crop and it's a GMO crop and it's substantially equivalent to one they're growing now, then it's up to the opponents to prove that there's some harm being done. And this avoids damage to the industry from false positives and false claims and damage, you know, uh, lawsuits, that sort of thing. The Canadian is much more a safe standard sort of approach in align with the precautionary principles. And it says that those who want to promote gen genetically modified organisms must prove they are safe, and thus, this is a precautionary principle, avoid damage to the ecosystem. So the burden of proof is in, is in different courts in these two different ways. And so this other precautionary principle plays out in a very real example of politics and environmental action. Okay, now we, what we want to do as environmental scientists and, and the citizenry that's involved in environmental science is to promote healthy ecosystems. And one of the reasons we want to do that is because a healthy ecosystem benefits everybody. A healthy watershed benefits everybody in that watershed. A healthy 
air shed with clean air. It benefits rich people, poor people, everybody. So this is one of the reasons why we, uh, why the social side and the environmental side and the economic side all come together over healthy ecosystems. They provide services such as cleaner air, cleaner and more water, biodiversity, many other benefits to society as a whole. So what we're trying to do is preserve these ecosystems and, and we have two issues with that. One is we want to avoid damage that might be irreparable and the other thing we might have to restore. And when we're up against that, we want to know, what's the definition of healthy? Well, there's many ways to define this. If you're a human, you might say you're healthy if you're not sick. Or you might say you're healthy if you're strong and vibrant. For this course, we're going to use a definition of healthy that is a healthy ecosystem is one that can experience stress and either remain in the same healthy state or even improve health. And th this, this last part is that as you experience a healthy organism or healthy ecosystem experience stress, it actually helps them adapt to that. A healthy ecosystem that has a little bit of fire is actually healthier than, a, than an ecosystem that never has any fire. A healthy person is one that might stress their, their um, lung and heart capacity every once in a while, not just sitting around in, a, in, a, in an average sort of heartbeat and breathing rate. See, so again, this is the idea of health is, is more, it, it, uh, the, the, it's dynamic that uh, that this stress can actually be good and all stress shouldn't be avoided. So what we want to do is understand the level of resilience and this is the amount of stress a system can withstand and stay in the same state. So if it's a healthy plus stress, stay, it still stays healthy. However, if it's sick and you're trying to heal it, it still stays sick. So I'm going to talk about this and just I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. But the amount of stress, we can think about it, and there's this ball and teacup metaphor. And over on the left here, we have this stable system where in order to get that ball out of this little cup, we have to shake the cup pretty hard. And so that's this healthy ecosystem that's in a, or a resilient ecosystem. And the, and the distance of resilience, the amount of stress it can take is from one edge of the cup to the other. In a metastable system, there's just this tiny little depression and just slight uh, slight shaking is going to have that ball roll down the side of the of the metastable cup. And then there's the other part of it might be near a threshold and when the, the ball is right near a threshold and you just tap it a little bit, you might not be doing anything really that much different, but just a slight addition and it's going to roll down the hill and, and change the state. So this is a, a visual metaphor for what we mean by resilience. Okay, now these three concepts are all related in this course. One, we want to make we want to make ecosystems better. There has to be the appropriate amount of stress. We don't want it to be just static, but we don't want to harm it. But often, like in the case of a metastable uh, system or a system on the edge of a threshold, we really don't know how far it is to to how much stress we might add as humans to that ecosystem in order to have it um, degrade into some other system. And a healthy ecosystem actually does better with a little bit of stress. Like I said before, fire can be healthy. This uh, uh, input in, uh, input of new species every once in a while, and the extinction of others, local extinction. This sort of dynamic uh, nature of the ecosystem can make it healthier. But resilience cuts both ways, and we need to remember this. If we have a healthy ecosystem, we might be able to. Um, uh, it might be able to endure some stresses of you know, a bad summer or or or, um, or or too much rain or these sorts of things. But it cuts the other way, too. If you have a damaged ecosystem and you're trying to restore it, you might have to really push it along direction. Uh, you know, you might have to add a lot of, of uh, encouragement and um, corrective behaviors in order to get that damaged ecosystem to come back up to be a healthy ecosystem. And this is very similar to human health when you think about it. If you're really sick and you're about ready to die, some surgeon might have to go in and start cutting around on you and make some major, uh, some major invasive procedures in order to get you well. If you're sort of near being well, well, maybe then just a little bit of medicine or exercise and some activities might get you to be well. And then if you're healthy, you can withstand quite a bit of, of, of stress maybe and, and not get sick again. So these are how these systems, think about that in terms of either trying to maintain a healthy system or restore 
a damaged ecosystem. So these are all related. 